Good morning, everyone, and welcome to activities for people living at home with dementia. We are proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available for viewing through a YouTube channel for future use. I am your host for today's activities. It is my pleasure to present Peggy Spear from the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art, who is bringing us butterflies. I've been looking forward to this. And Peggy, we were talking yesterday about, did we miss the migration? And you can probably tell us, it's all yours. <laughs> I absolutely cannot tell you that, but I did notice in like the last couple of weeks, just on our walks and out in our backyard, we've been seeing more butterflies. So I assume they were either their last flame of glory before, before they died, or if they were moving on through. So yeah. I'm, I'm assuming it's happening now, just based on my own observation, but I did not research that at all. Um, okay. So let me pull up my presentation. All right. Y'all can see it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Let me, let me make sure I can see all of you. Okay. All right. So we got a random smattering of butterflies in our collection. Whoa. Our first. <laughs> isn't this in a so hundred fun? years, I'd not call that a butterfly. Well, there is one. There is butterflies. I see cool. one, yeah, two, I see them, but three, four, goodness. five. These five butterflies. Yeah, this is the most. Um, artistic depiction of butterflies that in this um, group that we're looking at today. This is such, I feel like it's such a fun, um, just a fun scene. It's entitled Lions and Butterflies, which when I didn't see the title, I thought they were dinosaurs and butterflies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Did okay. too. Right. yeah. Morning, Nancy. Nothing morning. makes it feel too liony to me. Mm -hmm. But what makes it feel dinosaurish? What did you guys feel was dinosaurish? Um, the the shape of the head. Shape of the head the and the neck. And the squares, those cubes, kind of felt like scales, not necessarily yeah. fur or mm -hmm. hair. Okay, so there's like almost nothing written about this particular artwork, and um, but it was done at the Tamarin. Uh, the studio in LA, the lithography studio. But the, when I was researching this artist, she's a French, it's a woman, she's French. Her personal life was the real story that everyone kind of clings on to because she was married. Well, excuse me, she never married, but had two children with. Any guesses? Picasso. Picasso, you nailed really? it. Oh, yeah. wow. You nailed it. Whoa. So oh. her, her um, personal life was the more salacious story, which stinks that not all, a lot has been written about all of her artwork, but she was with Picasso from um, when she was 21 and he was 61 and they were together for about 10 years oh, and they my. had two kids. And then um, when he, so they were not together when she created this artwork, um, but he did influence her in some of the cubist um, art movement, the way that he was working at one point in time, which is very angular, almost like a, a crystallizing of patterns and re-blocking of a pattern. So you can kind of see it almost in the, what we were kind of saying, the scales of the lion or these cubes behind the lions. And then even the butterfly wings, which is giving it almost a sense of motion because it, yeah. it's... Mm -hmm itself in multiple ways so that was um she didn't like working in as hard of lines as Picasso which Picasso had a lot of very hard lines during his cubist phase so you can see there is some of that um softer rounder lines that she incorporates which isn't necessarily characteristic of Picasso but she was by the time she um was with Picasso and during her time with him, she was a well-known artist and in her own right, as a watercolorist, as a ceramicist. And she had, um, then as her relationship escalated with Picasso, her social status sort of eclipsed her, her artistic career, even though she created until the day she died. She was always in her studio and always making things. And um, 
I think almost every day she like made a point to do something creative, to paint, to do something like that. But she, um, interestingly enough, because, okay, so she was with Picasso, she ended up writing kind of like a, a tell-all about Picasso, which turned into like a whole thing and um, kind of exposed him for sort of the person he was, which he enraged him. And then he, first he ignored it and then it really angered him and the whole bit. So then she got married again, short-lived, and then she got married a third time to one of the creators of the polio vaccine in California. Oh. And so when she was in California, she was at the, uh, the lamp, uh, the, what is it? Tamarin lithography studio twice. When she was there in, she was there in 61 and then in 69, or no, she went twice in 69. In May, this was one of the times uh, when she made this. And then when she came back in October, that's when she met her then would be husband um, when she was in LA staying at the studio through friends of friends. That's how she, she met him. And they ended up having another child. Peggy, what was the big deal that she exposed about Picasso? You know, I think just maybe he was kind of a difficult person to work with, to be around. It, it was not a favorable um, in por portrayal of Picasso. Oh. And so I think he even tried to sue her for libel and all this. So it was like a very nasty, but they were never married. So it wasn't a divorce, but there, it was a very nasty breakup. He ended up finding another muse, I think. And, and she was sort of left, <laughs> left to herself. Thank you. Yeah. But she, um, she moved to the U S after they separated and um, then had two more marriages. So not, I was very interested mm -hmm. in all of her. If you give her a Google, you can see her studio. She has a really cool um, apartment in New York, or she did. She, I think she passed away in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. She had a really cool apartment in New York and, and lived in um, Southern California. I think I want to say like uh, La Jolla or Santa Barbara, somewhere <clears throat> in that realm. And um, she and her husband would spend months apart and then months together. And that was just kind of how their relationship worked. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Hey, Peggy. Mm -hmm. I noticed this looks like there's some architecture, some columns. Looks like maybe an amphitheater uh -huh. here. Is that significant yeah. to this picture? I Not that I could find. Okay. Um, I, and I don't know if this was a reoccurring theme in her artwork. Typically, the artists that were coming to Tamarin were trying to translate artwork themes and styles that were... Um, characteristic of them to this medium. Okay. So uh, do you have any other pieces in, in our collection that carried on that theme? So I don't know if outside of it, maybe, but not in our collection. Okay. Peggy, do you know what my first impression were of, of the lions? Tell me, please. Like hand puppets until hand I saw puppets, the, yeah. leg, <laughs> the legs uh, in, on the first one. Yes. Oh gosh, what a good call. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, they all have that like they all like have they that leg, six yeah. feet onto a sock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very um imaginative. It feels very playful. These are not threatening lions. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. Well, no. But oh. butterflies don't seem too afraid of them either. Mm -mm. No, it's yeah, it's just it's just a fun kind of kooky little scene. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, so we see some butterflies and lions here mingling. Now I'm gonna show you some of the more, probably what you were expecting mm. some more of butterflies. Um, Elliot Porter, we've looked at so many different photographs throughout Elliot Porter's career um, because we do have his archives. So we have all of his pictures and um, he was, you know, loved loved photographing nature and nature without man interrupting what nature was doing. So very, you know, these are very characteristic, but here is um, kind of like his bird pictures where he would place his camera and he would wait and wait and wait and wait until something happened and would just kind of stay parked at his camera for hours on end to see um, birds building nests, eggs hatching. And here we see a butterfly emerging from its cocoon. Mm. Mm. What do you think about this picture? Do you 
do you have any reactions to it or do you think it's pretty? Do you think it's ugly? It shows the transformation mm -hmm. from one, one, type, one phase in life to another. It feels very, um, yeah, there, of course, there's that transition from cocoon to butterfly. We're seeing it. It feels very textural. You can see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, all of the little Wait. looks um, like hair. hairs on the wings. Mm -hmm. You can almost feel like the ripple down here, how delicate it probably is. Even just the, the stick itself has a very distinct texture that he was able to capture. I wonder what kind of background it was that he got it to be gray. <laughs> My hunch is that it was very um, hyper-focused that it's just so, because it, it was in nature. He doesn't, he did not have like a greenhouse or anything like that where he, some artists would grow their own butterflies or whatever. Mm -hmm. This was out in nature. So it, it could, whatever is behind him is as it would be in, in nature. Mm. And that very, very sharp focus puts everything behind it, a blur. It, can, it wouldn't even recognize what it was. <clears throat> so here's one of his butterflies. And here's another, it's a moth, but. Yeah, it's a lunar hmm. moth. Hmm. My favorite. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Tell, it tell is us beautiful. about the moth, Don. What is it? Why is that your favorite, Don? Well, I did a, when I was like, I don't know, it was maybe fourth grade, I did a pro project. I had to draw a lunar moth. And uh, uh, I, I'm sure I put something about, uh, some information about it, but uh, it seemed like it had, uh, um, some, my re recollection is it had some interesting characteristics. Um, so, but I don't remember. They're, they look from this picture, they look pretty long. Yeah. Has anyone seen a Luna moth in the wild? No. Nope. Not no. Recognized. And I want to say when their wings are closed, they look very ho hum. It's when they're I mean, like with their wings are down there, they are very, um, not nearly as colorful as it looks right here. We, um, we used this photograph a couple of years ago for story time with our, um, our itty bitties. And we read one of Eric, is it Eric Carlisle's book? Mm -hmm. Eric Carl. And so it, he has a book about a Luna moth and it's, oh. it, is it there's just so fun and they're beautiful so so um lunar moths are called, uh, as a, a part of a group called the giant silk moths mm -hmm. is lying green colored wings their life their lifespan is about one week after they um get up uh, or, or come out of the chrysalis oh, oh really wow. that's not long mm -hmm. no. live it up baby I was looking at more of, I looked at some of the lifespans of the, the morning cloak, which these butterflies live all over North America. So you have probably yeah. seen these particular butterflies yeah. in your backyard. And these live for about three plus months. Wow. They live for a very, what, what to me feels like a very long time for a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And they prefer um, tree sap from oaks and um, trees like that. Please don't do that. Please don't oh no, I'm reading right here. They're about, I read my notes wrong. They're about three inches long, but they live 10 to 11 months. So they are, and okay. they are ones that migrate. Oh. Okay. They migrate. So those might be some of the ones you're seeing on their, their um, roam to wherever they go next. I've never just basically seen... looking for post plants and trees. I don't recall ever seeing hair on a butterfly. No, well, it's, it's uh, it, it, it's part of the process of its wings are not fully extended yet, and so is that what makes the caterpillar fuzzy? Is that what's like fuzzy on the caterpillar before it becomes? I, I don't know, but I think the fuzziness uh, clears away um, after it's fully the wings. Mm -hmm. The wings have to spread out, yeah. and the they they, they mm -hmm. have a resource in their bodies to do that. Kind of um, like an afterbirth that goes away. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Or like the uh, the like cottage cheese cheddar that comes out on a baby that's there and then it's <laughs> right into their skin. 
Yes. So these are, you know, we've seen him before with, with Porter. He is a naturalist. He loves photographing everything in nature. So he has tons of butterflies and insects that he has photographed throughout his career. And the, the printing process he uses is very elaborate. You're soaking it in multiple different colors to really get that um, saturation, I think is the word Martha's used in the past, that very heavy saturated photograph which makes the colors seem almost hyper real. Mm -hmm. All any, right. Any chance you're doing another um, gr grouping of Elliot Porter anytime soon? <clears throat> Not on the docket, no, but um, as long as John Moorbach, the curator of photography, the senior curator is here, I know well, another one's coming down the pipe. We just don't know when it's coming yet. Okay. If this I'm alive, let me know. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'll, you will be the first. Okay. So this is a fun one. We don't actually see the butterfly, but what do we see? The butterfly net. net. Somebody will catch them. Okay, so this is this is one of those words that is so hard for me to say. Lepidopterus. You did it yeah. well. What does well. that mean? It's a collector or researcher of moths and butterflies. Ah, okay. And so does the name? Okay, so it looks like it's Vladimir. It but that's not how he said his name. It's um, it rhymes with Redeemer. So Vladimir. Redeemer. Vladimir. Vladimir. Nope, Nobukov, which he Nabokov. talked about at different points in his life, how certain nationalities really butchered his name. He was a novelist, but can, I did not realize that he wrote this particular book, and maybe y'all know, I just didn't put two and two together. Lolita, did y'all ever read Lolita? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? That was a hot book. Whew, yeah. It was a hot book. Um, and he, yeah, so he was a very well-known novelist, and many people think he was robbed for not winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. So he, was a, he was a very well-known name. When an article came out in Life magazine in um, 1958, I or it came out in 1964, but these pictures were taken in 1958 about this, you know, this novelist and how he had always wished if he could do another career, it would be a curator of a butterfly and moth collection at a great museum. Oh. And so um, Carl Maidans, who was one of the original photographers at Life Magazine and then spent most of his career at Life, did um, took photographs of him and his wife, who was his editor um, and publisher. Uh, she, they he followed him around his property and took in New York and took pictures of him showing his butterflies, catching his butterflies on the hunt for butterflies. So it was a, a article that was well received in the day. And what I see, what I see this picture, so he's a butterfly collector. Uh, I, I'm thinking about uh, walls full of shadow boxes with pinned uh, butterflies and moths hanging on yep. the wall. You're exactly right. Um, in some of the other photographs in the article, we don't have them in our collection, but in the article, because um, he would do exactly that. He would display them. He would pin them. He's uh, putting butterflies in envelopes and like parchment envelopes oh, that yeah. um, you can tell that later he will be doing something with it to study them, to display them, to just kind of examine them. Okay. I really, yeah. the, the shadow intrigues me too in this picture. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, shadows. Yes. Oh, see, I thought that one thing might have been a reflection of, in the puddle right there is in the it, middle. Is it water? Yeah, it, it looks like it. It has to be. Yeah. This particular photographer was very interested in um, the journalistic. While they're beautiful pictures, he was really, he was a journalist. And so he was really trying to capture the essence of the moment versus creating um, an artistic aura, so to speak. And so we've seen pictures of his before, like when we were doing the ones, the strike, when we talked about Labor Day weekend and there was a, um, a woman on a ladder on, on Wall Street and the men were all around her. He yes. took that photograph for okay. Life magazine. So he he was telling a story, but everything is, he's capturing it and he's not posing these pictures. 
what I'm, I'm thinking, I, I might not, I might not mind a, a, a life where I got paid to capture butterflies and moths, collect them. I know he that was a life he wished he had also he had had. <laughs> if writing didn't work out for him, he wished that's that right. that was the path that he took. That's right. And to be able to do it with your wife or your best friend or somebody, yeah. I mean, like that sounds so fun. And so, this was something he did. Um, as long as he was alive, this was something that was an interest for him. So I feel like this is just a, a, I feel maybe you remember as a child doing this in your backyard, collecting butterflies, or if you have an interest now, even going to like estate sales or auctions, you always see, you know, butterflies pinned. That's always something that looks beautiful to display, even if you're not a researcher. So this is him in the action. All right, we've got two more butterflies or butterfly images. John James Audubon, have, we've all heard of John James, right? Mm -hmm. He is the, the bird guy, but he uh, also painted other uh, subjects such as insects. You can see here, a, yep. butterfly, a butterfly that's meeting its demise. And he did quadrupeds too in North America, but his birds are really what um, has gained, has put him on the map. But he just the same way that he was studying these birds and, and uh, anatomically depicting them accurately, he was doing the same thing for the butterflies and other insects he would depict on these um, artworks as well. It almost so, looks like a skeleton. Doesn't it? The, the teeth of the skeleton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh. you're right. You're getting ready for Halloween early, huh, Martha? <laughs> I've seen the foreshadowing of October. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. You're just getting in that mindset. Mm -hmm. I'm, leading, I'm, I'm dropping little Easter eggs up until that point. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so you can... Um, his, his insect pictures are a little harder to find, but he incorporates them um, in a lot of his bird. bird I, hope he, head, I um, hope he doesn't always show them as bird food. Yeah, bird food. So. Right. And then, so, okay, so Aud Audubon was, of course, doing his thing in the early 1800s, and he very heavily influenced two men, two Fort Worthians, Stuart and Scott Gentling. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar. Yes, with. yes, we've talked about them. Uh huh. Yes. So the Gentlings, we write uh, just last week, Thursday, we opened an exhibition um, featuring Stuart and Scott Gentling's artwork. They were uh, twin brothers, but uh, and best friends lived together their entire life, but two years um, for when Scott, the other brother, went to uh, art school in Philadelphia. Other than that, they never married. They lived together the entire their entire lives, and they were um, considered themselves ge gentlemen of the art, naturalists. And this was this is earlier in their career that um, Stuart, one of the brothers, created or you know hand drew and then painted um, moths that he had found in nature they were very they tried to emulate their they did a whole bird series just like audubon um okay. that they tried to emulate sort of the naturalist life of an artist that audubon did they, mm. didn't, they were not successful in that um but they they were very um very good in their own right, just in a different way. And so in this exhibition that just opened there, you can see some of their earlier, um, when they were just starting to learn how to use opaque watercolor um, and, and drawing and things like that. They were both really good draftsmen. See you, Steve. Bye-bye, see you tomorrow, Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye, Steve. Peggy, I know they, they had something to do with the artwork in the bass. Mm-hmm. Did they paint they did. all? Did they paint all of the bass or just the the ceiling? I think you just know. the ceiling, but they had plans and the dome. But they had plans on what the bass hall needed to look like with, and that was not asked of them. And so, um, like for example, they really hated the angels with the trumpets <laughs> on the front. 
They said, no, 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 we think we're the West. This is too classical. We should have horses jumping out of the, you know, the architecture. <laughs> well, of course, the Bass family said, uh, no, we think you <laughs> put on the other things, yeah. and that's where we leave you. And so um, that, yeah, they, they, those are the same, that's the same set of, of brothers. So again, what did they paint inside the? The, the, the domes. If you the dome. The domes, okay. Yeah. And if you look in the dome, there are two birds and that depicts the two brothers. Oh, how interesting. I'm surprised you didn't know that, Peggy. I, you know what? We just got the um, tour this morning with the curator and it's only 30 minutes yes. long. So I haven't moved oh. up on this exhibition, but um, okay. a, a cool perk is that right when an exhibition opens, the curator will walk with staff um, for about 30 to 45 minutes, depending, um, and go through the show. So the staff gets kind of a private preview before the public. Oh, oh that's wow. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so the Gentling, there's, I think over, I wanna say over 170 artworks in this exhibition. It's massive. Um, and some artworks Scott worked on exclusively, some Stuart worked on exclusively. Stuart was, Scott was more of the natural. Stuart um, took a little more practice and warming up to becoming as good as he was. Um, Scott went to the Philadelphia School of Art um, and was really good etcher and did it for his, you know, for about a year and then walked away from etching and um, got really into watercolor. They were both good draftsmen. And so what Scott was learning, he would then teach his brother. Um, so then wow. Stuart eventually got, you know, better and better as his brother helped him improve some of those skills. So these aren't pinned butterflies. These are watercolors of pinned butterflies. That's right. Exactly. And, and hmm. Stuart also learned how to taxidermy birds when they were in their big Audubon phase. And so um, he, they were Texan through and through. And so the, they have pheasants and other um, birds that are hunt, often hunted in Fort Worth or, you know, in the area in North Texas. And so um, these butterflies are ones that he had found, hmm. I believe in Texas, but if not, he was copying copying something from another book. It's not as far okay. as going to South America to, to study the butterflies. <laughs> Some artists did. Those are not, these are not those artists. They didn't want to leave home. No, they are very interesting characters to say the least. Um, that you kind of learn as that unfolds in the exhibition, but they were each other's best, best, best friends. And so um, it's very interesting, the different phases of artwork they were. And we'll look at them. I think familiar faces is one of the themes we're doing in October. And they were, um, you know, got to pay the bill somehow. So they were really well-known portraitists in the area. Um, one, and then some of their artwork hung in the White House when Bush was in office. They were commissioned to do a portrait of Bush. So they are, uh, a very well-known Texan artist, but the things they were doing were not what was in vogue at the time. So they, and they knew that and they had no problem with it, but um, that's kind of why they're not in the, the, the canon, as they say, of art history, um, the same way that other artists were because they weren't producing the, the trends of the time. Are they, are they still alive? No, uh, Stuart died in 2006. And his brother died maybe six or eight years later. Okay. So no. Okay. But, but all over Fort Worth, all over Texas, um, many people collect their artwork. And um, they actually had an estate sale when they passed away. So like people on staff went and have a pheasant of theirs and things like that. So <laughs> wow. um, kind of funny, but yeah, they are, they are Fort Worth staples. Mm-mm. Well, I bet that was some sale. I know. I wish I knew about it. It happened since I've worked here. I don't know what. I was disappointed to learn after the fact. Mm -hmm. But anyway. All right, friends. Well, those are our, our beautiful butterflies for the day. Next week, wow. we're back and we're, we're doing the fences. The topic I couldn't do a couple weeks ago because I'd bring one of the kids to the pediatrician. But um, we are back with fences next week. Are your are your little ones doing okay, Peggy? Yeah, it's it's just 
every week it's like strep throats going around school, pink eyes going around school. So it's like, yeah. which, which illness are we going to get this week? So we're all fine. Just okay. Another, pediatrician like knows us by first. And we have like a cot there now. Like, hey, we're back. <laughs> a plaque. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. All right, friends. Well, it was all good seeing you and I will see you next week. Thank you. Have, have, have a happy week. Bye. Bye.